Okay. Calling to order the Transportation Advisory Board meeting for October 21st. Um, we can do a call, a uh, roll call. Board Member Wicklin? Here. Chair Lehner? Here. Board Member Call Coffer? Here. Okay. Uh, since we don't have a quorum, I guess we will uh, contain this to information items uh, since we can't vote on anything. Um, we can't even approve the minutes, so I guess we'll move to communications from staff. Yeah, thank you. Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. Just wanted to update you on some things. First of all, I wanted to introduce our new transportation planner, Kaylee Fallon. I'm going to have her come up and just kind of introduce herself for a few moments and uh, tell us her background a little bit. And uh, uh, I think that's about it. Thanks. Hi, good evening. My name is Kaylee Fallon. Like Phil said, I'm the new transportation planner here at the city. Um, prior to coming over to the city, I was the emerging mobility and transportation demand management planner for Dr. Cog. I was there for about four years. Um, and prior to that, I was getting my master's degree in um, sustainable planning management. So happy to be here and um, put names to faces. So thanks, Phil. Thank you. And we all only lasted Dr. Cog for four years. That's kind of the rule of thumb. Um, that's in the record now. Um, so Vision Zero Task Force, I'm going to have Cammie now come up and talk a little bit about Vision Zero Task Force. You have some items at your desk tonight to help you prep on some of these items that are coming up. Also, uh, World Remembrance Day for victims of uh, traffic, or traffic uh, crashes. So thanks, Cammie, for helping us. Yes. Hello, board members. You should have the hard copy. You got the electronic copy sent to you at about 5.15 this evening, and I think it'll be follow up in the um, post meeting minute. So if you have an opportunity to share about either option, our task force is kicking off next Monday night. Um, and I just want to clarify what we're going to try to do is for boards that are pre-existing, such as this one and other lo local advisory groups, you don't have to feel like you'll bring, you don't need to bring a member to the task force. This is more for individuals and members of the public who would have no other way to interact. You're more than welcome to come as board members. But if you come and want to just represent yourself instead of the board member, we'll bring obviously Vision Zero to you officially to the board. Um, and then World Day of Remembrance, you may have heard about this. Um, it's an international event that happens worldwide to recognize those that we have lost to roadway violence. Um, so being now that we are a Vision Zero community, we wanted to make sure in our first year that we pulled off an event. Um, so it's going to be on Sunday, November 3rd. We promise it does not interact with the Broncos game. We made sure to schedule around that, but it will still be light enough that people and families can come and hopefully enjoy some snacks and foods. We'll have some guest presenters. We'll kind of talk about what the current state and condition is in Longmont and where we plan to go. We'll have a call to action. It's going to be centered around safer speeds in Longmont. So a lot of the same information you've been hearing in other places, but it's going to create a space for those families and friends and loved ones to come and commemorate um, the people they've lost and or recognize the survivors that are in our community. So just creating space for this kind of opportunity. We're excited for next year. We've already been talking about partnerships to um, connect it to Dia de los Muertos, being that the communities and culturally appropriate are already honoring those they have lost. So I think we're excited for what this could become in the future as well. So you, of course, are all invited to both. Um, but just know for the formal task force, any conversations or any planning or feedback, we will bring that to you. So don't feel obligated to have to come to this version. We will keep you in the loop. But thank you. Any questions for Cami before she goes? <laughs> Great. Another update from staff is that we have the microtransit going fast and furious as far as trying to get it planned and implemented. The plan right now is to have it implemented in early December of this year. That, that's uh, due to a number of reasons, but really it's because we, have to, we had to restructure the contract to make sure that we could get the new mobility hub at I-25 and 119, which is outside of the RTD district, into our microtransit model, even though it's funded by RTD. So I don't know if 
the pieces are coming together, but the idea that RTD funded this made it so that they didn't want to fund anything that was beyond their boundaries. So we have taken on that role of separating the contract into two different pieces here so we could do the RTD version and then the extension through the city only version. So we are going to be doing that again in early December. Early December, you'll see all the different advertising and marketing campaigns for that coming out probably within the next month here as we start to gear up for that. But we're very excited uh, for that. And then last thing on our list was TAB in November. We're just uh, wanting to let you know that we think we'll be fine not doing the TAB on November 11th, which is our Veterans Day, and a day off or holiday for the city. So we think we can get all the things, especially if we can get the crash report done today, we can get all the things in December that we need to do. And we can talk about that at the end of the meeting. But uh, all, what's on the list for that? That's all we have right now from public or from staff. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thank you, Phil. Um, okay. Uh, any public invited to be heard? Does not look as we do. Oh, bring up the crash report. And then I guess we'll move to the action items, the uh, crash report. Thank you, Chair Lehner, um, board members, Jim Angstadt, Director of Engineering Services. Uh, this evening, we are here to present the uh, City of Longmont 2024 Annual Roadway Crash Report. Uh, it is in draft format. Um, we have a, uh, it was provided to you, I believe, Friday um, with a, another draft version. And um, we just want to provide a, a brief presentation to go over some of the highlights uh, for that. And then we can we can dive into it, answer any questions, uh, or um, um, and, and see where you want to want to take that. There we go. Um, report structure. Uh, it's divided into a number of sections. Um, and then appendix, uh, it's got an intro, crash information, and then our, our sections that, that uh, we have been um, collecting data on and, and, uh, and involve yearly trends, individual injuries, time trends, um, the fatal crash comparison with other cities, and highest crash locations, fatal crash details. And then our appendix is basically uh, the intersections and the street segments and basically just the listing of, of the, the uh, kind of the number of crashes alphabetically. Um, some of the highlights, um, just want to go over real quick. Uh, yearly trends. Um, in 2023, the population obviously continues to increase. Um, there were 2,051 total crashes. Um, when you look back into previous crash reports uh, to look at at previous years, those numbers will be different for the total crashes. Um, we have now in started to include, we've gone back and we've included the state roads, um, namely 66, which had not been included in, in previous reports, so we now are including those. Um, so uh, the trend, we're still seeing a trend up for total crashes. Um, not, a, not a, you know, huge increase, but it is trending up. Um, although it is lower than pre-COVID uh, numbers. Uh, in 2019, pre-COVID, before kind of people got off the roads in 2020, and we saw our accident uh, our crash history drop, uh, 2019 had like over 2,300 crashes. So we're still lower than, than pre-COVID numbers, which, you know, when you look at data, uh, you could look at it a dozen different ways to comparison. And, you know, sometimes I'll look at it in a favorable light. And, I think we're, 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 well, certainly 2,000 crashes seems to be a lot. You know, we're covering 356 miles, 100,000 people, and miles and mi hundreds, let me say hundreds, millions of trips a day on our, let me say millions of trips a year on our roads. Do we calculate the empty? Uh, yes, we have a... Um, estimate based on our arterials, um, but we're trying to integrate more of our daily trips uh, inner city as well to our VMTs, but we do have a VMT number for um, for presentations. Did we use the VMT numbers as a pr 
proportion against the crash report so we know that COVID VMT was extremely low, as we know, what the VMT numbers were prior to COVID as what they are now. We didn't dig that deep into some of the data. Okay. Um, so we also have started looking at fatal and serious injury crashes, um, 68 um, in 2023. It, that is trending down. Um, in 2021, there was 80, in 2022, 72. So, you know, the trend is going down. And still, that is also much lower than some of the pre-COVID numbers we saw in 2019 with 111. We also have a, a section on individual injuries. Um, I wanted to distinguish this is different than total crashes. Um, this is a kind of a provides us data for the overall fatalities and injuries um, for the, the the period of the study um, versus the number of crashes. So some in some crashes may have two fatalities or two or three serious injuries. So we started summing those numbers up. Um, the age group um, 20, 25 to 29 is the highest. Um, 413 fatalities and injuries overall. And then you can see the breakdown of pedestrians, bikes, motor vehicles, and then motorcyclists. Um, we have a section on time trends as well. Um, October still remains the highest uh, number of, of all crashes. Not sure why. Um, the data is not going to tell us that. Uh, we'd have to dig a little deeper into to investigating some of the reports, but could be that, that times the, the, it's starting to get dark earlier. Uh, it's after school starts. We start to see maybe more activities in the in the fall. Um, so uh, it is it is still a uh, October. I we can't figure it out. Um, crashes and minor injuries. Um, the highest month is July, with around 143 on the average. Uh, all crashes for day of the week uh, is Friday, about 1,500. Um, and then FSI cra crashes and, and minor injuries for day of the week. Thursday is uh, the highest, although we've, I've thrown in Wednesday and Tuesday as well. Midweek seems to be have relatively high numbers. And then overall time of the day, um, the, the report has the five-year uh, trends. I only noted um, time of day for 2023 in this presentation is five to six. Um, you know, people get out of work seems to be the, the mo when we might see the most cars on the road. Um, this, this slide is a little difficult to, to, to get to, so I need to ask if you look at the, the report itself. Um, we've, we've had this a number of years. It's a comparison with other cities. Five-year average uh, is still around 7.6. When you base it on 100,000 population, we, we threw that in as a column. We're at about 7.7 .7 accidents uh, you know, or fatalities per year. Um, the ranking seems to be about the same. We may have moved up uh, a little bit higher. Um, what I do want to note that in our, our history in, in Longmont, fatal crashes in 2023 dropped by half. Previous years were eight. Um, it's last year we had four. Uh, to date this year in Longmont, in 2024, we've had four uh, fatals, um, one of which was in the last two weeks. Um, but if that trend continues, if you look at earlier in the in the, the report, we had a, a high year of 12 fatals. That'll drop off in the future report, and we'll probably see a, a, a pretty good change. Um, digging into a little more into the, the some of the meat of the report, we also have some, some tables with the high crash locations. Um, we have listed the top 25 intersections by total crashes. Um, not a big surprise that Highway 119 and Main Street tops the list, as it has for a number of years. A um, little bit of a surprise that 17 in Maine is the second highest, um, although that 117 is down from previous years at that intersection. Um, more than likely, we've done, uh, CDOT came in a few years ago, did some, some access management, put some medians on Maine, probably reducing some of the, the cross traffic um, and has helped, but it's still a high intersection. Um, we've broken out the intersections with five or more uh, fatal and serious injuries. Uh, ninth and in Maine is, is of concern uh, with 10. 
And then we also listed the intersections with at least one um, fatal serious crash. 21st and Hover has, has, has four. Um, and then there's, uh, there's others listed. Um, we've also included top 25 segments of roadways by total crashes. Um, so we're seeing a lot in Highway 19 between South Pratt Parkway to Main Street. Um, segments with uh, five or more FSI crashes, Hover Nelson to Boston is a little bit on the high side. And then um, we have one fatal there in the last five years. So there are, are you know, it's, it's a higher speed as it gets off of Nelson. Um, a lot of cross traffic going into Home Depot. Um, that could change in the future because we're going to be make, making that driveway a right in, right out. And there's also a signal going in just north of Fair, or just north of Home Depot at the Fair, new Fairgrounds Marketplace, the extension of Mountain Brook. Um, and then the last one is segments with at least one FSI crash, which is Highway 66, and it has basically four in that area. Um, some things to note about this. Um, one of the items we, we look at um, is to, with our crash reports is what where we need to focus on work. So on at least two of these intersections that are listed here, there are, are future projects being worked on. Uh, 21st and Main is they're looking at it for as part of the Main Street Quarter project. And we've been working with public safety on the, the segment on uh, 119 um, to put in some access management. CDOT's said, go ahead, let's show us what you got. And so we're, we're working on getting consultants to start laying that out. And then we're closing out with kind of the, the final items. We have a, a section on fatal crash details, which if we've been before, uh, has some more detail on, on some of the fatals. Um, it's taken directly from from the crash reports that we, we get from the state that are on the, uh, the set form. Um, and then the appendix, which has all of our intersection crashes. We've, we've listed them this year alphabetically, so it's a little bit easier to read uh, than just, you know, starting at the, the, the highest number of crashes and working your way down. Um, in, in doing some analysis on this um, last week, uh, it, it's a lot easier to read than if you, if you know what kind of the intersection first, then you can see the numbers. Um, so I closed out this presentation with just some information on reporting traffic issues. As you could report on almost anything in the city, um, you know, service works in the email are, are uh, online um, or call the public works uh, service works or police non-emergency. And as are always, if it's an emergency, 911. Um, and with that, uh, just a couple of, of notes, comments on the, the, the traffic report. Um, we utilize this report um, as one of our tools to, to help us identify where we should be utilizing some of our limited resources. Um, it can be utilized as a measure of success in comparing to previous reports of work we have done. Um, and I'll cite a couple of examples in that um, in 2018 at Clover Basin and Airport, we had some incidents with some, some school kids getting hit. Um, we made some changes to the signal, um, namely that we made it um, on the left turns, we made it a permit, per, protected versus permissive. I always confuse those. Um, and so in this report, last year's, year's report had 20, showed 28 incidents accidents, crashes. Uh, this year we're down to 21. So it takes time to see the results of that, but um, we do see that. An exa another example would be Highway 66 in Maine. Similar situation in the, in the north and southbound direction. We put in permissive, took out the protective. Um, in 23's report, there were 125 crashes there, reduced in this report to 110. Still high, but we see some improvement. Um, the biggest change we probably saw was south of 119 on Main Street at Grand Avenue. Uh, CDOT came in and, and we, we, we work with them. They identified a number of crashes in that uh, area, um, put in the concrete median, made Grand Avenue right in, right out on both, both, uh, on both sides of the road. 
Um, in 2023, there was 45 crashes total over a five-year period, and now in 24, on that five-year report, we're down to 23. Um, the opposite's true also. We have some, some increases in some intersections, so that would, would lend us to what we can focus on in the coming years. Um, I'll point out 9th and Main, um, we were down at 85 in 23's report. This year, we're up to 97. So there's some concern there that when we see those swings or changes, we're gonna we're gonna pay some attention to some of those areas, um, and and some of those you know some of what we do can can be quick fixes. It can be uh, additional signing um, that signalized intersections. It could be eliminating right right turn on reds. Uh, it's adding more signing. Could be some striping changes. Um, you know on on Main Street we've had median enhancements that has appeared to help. So it, um, to help with with access management. And then, you know, futures looking at, at larger scale CIP projects as well. Um, one of the projects Kyle's trying to, to line up is at 17th and Airport. We've had some, some issues there. Um, so we're looking at traffic signal roundabout. Um, we chased a grant earlier this year. We were not successful, um, but we'll continue with that. And so with that, I'll open it up to any questions and turn it over to Phil. So I just wanted to add one last thing, or maybe we should have added it at the very beginning is, so you're gonna see lots of numbers today, and you have, but we recognize as a staff that, and I think you do too, that each one of these numbers is a human that's out there, one of our citizens, or somebody who's part of the fabric of our society and being impacted. So we don't wanna go past and say that you know, obviously we have to anal an analyze the data, and this is how we do it with numbers, but we do recognize that each one of these people has been affected, as especially when you talk about serious injuries and, and fatalities, that's their families and, and, and um, you know, it's a broader sense of the community that's been impacted by that. And unfortunately, a lot of us know people who have been affected by these. I, I can say that I think one of your TAB members for sure has, has been impacted by this. So it's not just numbers on a page, but it does represent something bigger. So we just want to recognize that um, and just hope, hope you understand that we also have to look at the data and how it, how it, um, you know, how we approach these things as we move forward, especially with Vision Zero. Thanks. Taylor, I'll start with you. If you want to ask some questions, I'm sure you do. Yes? Okay. Phil, thanks for saying that. Um, that's really important for us to humanize the, the data, but also knowing that we have to you know, look at the data as well. Um, I have a qu couple questions. So with that uh, new development that's going in north of Home Depot, um, is there, I, I know you said that there's gonna be a, a new light that's going there. Is there gonna be changes to the Rogers Grove uh, Boston Hover intersection as well. So when you're turning left, going towards Home Depot, uh, with that additional traffic, is that also in the plan to to change either the lighting or timing, just north of Home Depot? Um, yeah. So when we do install that new signal, we'll be retiming the signals. Um, and it kind of co coincides nice with our uh, new traffic signal upgrade project on Hover Street, which will begin beginning of the year. Um, so we'll be changing out that uh, traffic signal system from uh, basically Pike to 66 on Hover. Um, oh. So we'll be retiming everything with brand new detection and uh, way more advanced features than what's currently available. Super. Great. Um, with that uh, serviceworks.longmontcolorado.gov, um, if we hear people coming to us with complaints, should we fill those out on their behalf or should we direct them towards that? Like this uh, afternoon, somebody was like, hey, what's going on with... Uh, Pratt Parkway in 119, the new striping and signage is really confusing and uh, we don't know how to navigate it. Do we direct them to, to make complaints on that? What what are some of the things that you want people to go to that ServiceWorks at Longmont? We would recommend that you steer them to ServiceWorks. Perfect. Um, they, they can choose to, to make a, a, you know, to put in a, a request anonymously. Um, if they give us a name and contact information, they can elect to, hey, listen, I'd like a response for what the, what the, uh, the solution is. Um, we've done that a number of times. 
Perfect. So what we always always recommend that, that, that if residents got a complaint, sometimes it gets lost in translation, we recommend that they go directly to ServiceWorks or to call. Now the call the call center is only open eight to five Monday through Friday, but uh, online is is you can go in any time. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if, I, and I know it's hard to do, but with the crash reports, are, are we looking at contributing factors and starting to chart that? Uh, yes, through Vision Zero, we're working on more of an interactive experience when it comes to our dashboards. And instead of having this annualized report that shows just injuries, possible injuries, uh, what we're trying to bring is uh, something internally with staff where we can really see what causes um, these accidents through the police reports. So um, rear ends, broadside, side swipes, parked vehicles, um, single vehicle, multi-vehicle, um, as well as suspected as um, impairment on alcohol, marijuana, um, other, other illicit drugs. Um, and then the intent with Vision Zero is to bring this, that information to a dashboard for residents to be able to click through and, you know, get their information more readily available through there instead of asking staff. Um, so you can really filter those out on a uh, what you're interested in looking at basis. And, and we are tracking then contributing factors such as excessive speed. Yep. Yeah, we have speed, um, uh, improper uh, equipment, um, as well as uh, violation data. Right, right. And and I'm, I'm imagining, because I know it'd probably be very difficult to do the inattentive in it inattentive driving mm -hmm. factor is always i know fairly difficult to either prove un unless somebody goes far enough to get cell phone records and that sort of a thing do we even track any of that if it's uh, something that is either admitted to and or apparent um there is the data reporting is possible with our new um, reporting system that started in 2022 uh, it's not always filled out so it's kind of a wishy-washy metric um but a lot of the causes for the accident and then corresponding with um, the violation given, um, it's a little easier to kind of suspect out if distracted driving was part of that. Is there any any uh, way that that information, not just in a dashboard, I think that's very valuable, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. um, could be used at a point of contact with drivers in the effect of, you know, even if it's public safety, saying your excessive speeding and last year in Longmont at this intersection, we had three fatalities, and three of them were, you know, speeding. I realize they they don't have a rolodex of that information, mm -hmm. but the point is, is that if we provide some context to the offenders about the causes of accidents and the severity of these accidents in some of these intersections, possibly we could stop maybe one accident. That's what I'm thinking. Yep, and I think it'd be part of what uh, Cami's team is doing with Vision Zero. Um, part of ours is engineering and enforcement. But a really large portion has to be education, not just education for putting out flyers or Facebook posts. It's for informing those drivers who are getting crashes, getting citations, and how to correspond with just because it doesn't seem like a big issue to you. These are the issues we have on a, a macro scale of just because you're doing it, there's a thousand other people doing it at this area too. And we need to start reducing that number down to get these crashes down. Sure. Um, I guess the other thing would be if we're talking about engineering and design. Um, you know, uh, that's pretty important to me. So have we looked at any of the segments and talked about things like road diets, uh, adding trees, adding a uh, dedicated bike um, facility that's uh, separated? Uh, those things obviously will bring down speeds. And I know some of these segments can be fairly dangerous. Um, is that even a discussion point when it comes to some of these, um, these segments? Thanks for asking that. That's a big component of the transportation mobility plan, and we'll be talking about that in uh, probably around February of next year. So we're finalizing that plan, and a lot of that has to go has to do with how you implement the road diets as part of a priority aspect when everybody's looking at the CIP capital improvement program for various projects. So how does that rank? Can and, we overlay and how do we the use, crash report? Yeah, how do we yeah. use the crash report too right. to justify or exactly exactly okay that makes perfect sense um i think i'm good although i will note um clover basin at um airport 
you've got to add more green on that left-hand turn. I've, I've seen so many near misses in that intersection. It's just waiting. And I know you say that people are either on their cell phone or they're inattentive and they're not getting through the light fast enough. I've counted it. It's not enough seconds for the people that are, that are queuing up, especially uh, during school, school from 3, 3.30 to about 5 or 5.30. That left-hand turn is notoriously bad. And I see drivers kind of, you know, gaming the system, if you will. I've, I've actually seen a Rhode Island uh, left, if you know what that is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just, just Is that saying. what it's called? A Rhode Island left? <laughs> That's what I've heard it. What, what direction? Uh, at that intersection? It, it would be the southbound airport to Clover Basin. To Clover Basin to go yeah. east? Yep. Okay. And it's usually in the afternoon? Definitely the 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 queue, okay. the storage. It goes past the um, you know the um, the curve of the right. the yeah. It's it, it's pretty dangerous. Yeah, that's one of the intersections we have a camera on, so yeah. we can we can look at yeah. and, and we can check it out tomorrow. Yeah, and see. So we'll get some we'll get some better data, but we'll look at it certainly. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Laner, for uh, you know bringing up uh, kind of the design <laughs> of roads um, because I, I think ultimately I think when we approach vision zero, we should also be looking at our, you know, our, what is the, our theoretical design speed of a roadway? So, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, there, the crash was caused by excessive speeding, but is the road too wide that promotes excessive speeding uh, t type of thing? So even though I want everyone to, you know, slow down and pay attention and look at the actual speed limit, um, I think sometimes we, we have actual opportunities to slow people down via road diets, et cetera. Ask if they could use the crash report as part of the design criteria. There we go. Did you hear that? Use the crash report as part of the design criteria for roadways. Yep, and uh, we do on, we have several design projects in the works right now, uh, mostly with some state agencies. And there is a shifting attitude, especially it's hard to get CDOT to agree some more, but starting to move now in the right direction where design speeds are starting to come down to actual driving speeds versus uh, leaving that factor of safety. Um, so when we're discussing these future projects, we're talking about making the design speed the speed that is posted versus um, designing a road for, let's say, 45 and then post it for 35 or for 40. Hmm. Um, so that's definitely a changing attitude in kind of trans transportation industry. Um, and that's something that we're, we're fighting for of lowering speed limits, lowering that, you know, connect energy when it comes to accidents, uh, trying to reduce the, um, serious injuries as well as being able to navigate through intersections at lower speeds. We can do tighter turn radiuses, um, f faster cycles. Um, so it gets traffic moving more efficiently, but also more consistently. All right. And then, um, and then kind of, you know, I think I brought this up every year uh, so far is, is kind of how do we use these numbers? Um, because I, I think of projects that we, we have talked about is like the Third Avenue improvement projects. Um, you know, we narrowed the lanes. We added a stop sign at Sherman and Francis. Um, but I would like to note that on the crash report, you know, Third and Francis had two crashes in the last five years, third and Bowen had 17. Um, and I did ask during that conversation is how come we're not doing improvements? Uh, so, so I'm just wondering how do we, how do we prioritize certain, certain improvements, but then not others where maybe there's a higher number of crashes, maybe higher risk for people, but we're not doing anything there. Yeah. So a lot of it is going to be a changing areas, it's kind of like the switch che the Swiss cheese fix where it's not going to be one fix is going to fix the entire roadway system. Um, so we make these improvements like road diets, lane shifts. Um, it may direct traffic one way or another, or could also affect the cross traffic as well. Um, so we're looking at third Avenue is when this last section is getting paved, I believe this week and mm. next. Yeah. Uh, so finally get out of your guys' <laughs> hair. Um, we do have uh, speed radars at several locations along that street that are actually collecting speed data. Mm -hmm. um, throughout there. And then uh, through our Vision Zero process, we're changing or at least evaluating our uh, criteria and standards for um, stop signs, crosswalks, and other uh, um, street furniture for appropriate locations. 
Um, so through a task force, we can establish those standards and be able to provide an equal approach um, to every area, every park, every school, um, just so it's on a very consistent basis and not because um, the loudest squeaky wheel is in one area versus right. the uh, people who don't really speak up get neglected year after year after year. Okay. And yeah, there, there's a lot of squeaky wheels over there. So, but I, I you know, I, uh, it comes back to that question again is why did we choose not third and Bowen when there is higher crash reported there? Um, so that area, we did provide extra crossbars as well as um, adding uh, better uh, uh, ramps, ADA ramps for mm -hmm. their direct lines now, um, as well as delineating the uh, parking lanes and reducing the uh, drive lanes through there. So that was done in 2020. Last summer. Three. Yeah. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're coming off a year, and the hardest part about that section is it's been continuous utility work, water yep. work, gas work. Um, so once this work is done, we can see how the railway truly functions on a daily basis and be able to really evaluate um, what additional ne fixes are needed um, for that area. All right. So the work's not completely, the work's never not yeah, yeah. done. We're yeah. continually evaluating it and we're seeing those trends um, year after year. Okay. And, and I'm not arguing against not having a stop sign at Francis. I'm, I'm just making the point that there is higher crash at Third and Bowen rating. So I'm just wondering. You know, I'm still wondering uh, why, why we didn't really do much actionable things there. Uh, but but we'll find out when, when the whole project is done, and hopefully the data will come through. Uh, and then I, I think it was mentioned by another board member, uh, Pratt Parkway, all the new striping. I've heard a lot of comments about that from members of the public getting confused. And I, I even, you know, I uh, part of me, there's the forced... Uh, right turn heading when you're heading uh, south on Pratt Parkway into like the Safeway where the fire department is right there. Um, you know, there is a flashing sign. Uh, I see a lot of people not following uh, this. Uh, there's a bit confusion. Um, I'm wondering if we're just waiting for an accident to happen. Um, I, I don't know if there's enough room like we did here out on 3rd avenue of delineators to actually direct people to turn um but you know it, it's a thought um because I, I like what we did here and i think it's an experiment that we could try elsewhere because again it's it's a matter of physics instead of a flashing sign yeah so the changes to that intersection weren't necessarily new intersection changes uh it was stemming from a project and i believe it was 2018 um it started and that project brought um, extension of the center med uh, concrete median, as well as uh, basically adding a bike bike lane on the west side uh, to line up to the intersection. Before there was not a bike option, mm -hmm. um, so that bike option was added. And in the plans, it showed that lane dropping off. Um, but in the final approved plans, there was never any signage or delineation of which lane goes where. Um, that was kind of brought to my attention through a uh, times call inquiry. And so what we did was we reflected that change that was intended in the plans uh, to make that right turn a right turn only. Mm -hmm. um, and the through lane would go through the intersection. Um, it's been an iterative process. We added signs. We added the two actually um, flashing LED right turn light, uh, lights to help get some compliance. Um, there's been better compliance, but still not where we need it to be. Uh, we talked with PD. Um, that intersection does provide a lot of uh, different groups needing to use that, as well mm -hmm. as the fire department. Yep. Um, and so we're currently evaluating and trying to see if there's a better um, configuration that can satisfy all needs of transportation. Um, but you're correct with the uh, being too tight with a bike and then two large yeah. cars. Uh, it ends up squeezing that bike really more yeah. than I'd prefer. <laughs> um, so we're looking at what's the best way to get all modes of travel through that intersection. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of confusion from the public of what's going on. So, um, and I just hope we're not waiting for an accident to happen. No. So, um, that, that's all I have for now. So, thank you. I've got a couple more. <laughs> um, concerning design, are you still using 85th percentile as part of the design process? In studying 
um, speed limits or just evaluating speed general, limits? Just, just generalist speeds in the area. Still, um, we take it as a factor as um, you know, it's been at least standard, but it's not the only speeding criteria we actually take account for. So, okay. Um, and then I'm curious on the driver feedback units. Is there any studies that show whether they're effective or not? Um, yes. So they're pretty good at informing drivers who are maybe just coasting, going about their day, you know, long, long day at work or long way going to work. You're just blanking out and driving and let you know, hey, you're going a little fast. Um, where you see a little less um, effectiveness is just the plain speeders who are going to speed. Um, so there is a reduction in um, overall speed with those feedback signs, but um, they're not, not going to solve the high-end speeding problems. Sure. Um, and then I guess the last thing would be, would this crash data be effective in regards to looking at these segments that we have excessive speed <clears throat> and starting the conversation around speed cameras? Um, so there is a uh, ordinance or resolution Ordinance, uh, going to council tom tomorrow tomorrow, um, for the approval of uh, speed and red light running cameras. Um, so working with PD um, with uh, Chief Satter and then uh, Cami as well. Um, so working all three together to uh, possibly implement that technology in the city. Great. So that, that um, second reading is tomorrow evening. Okay. for the approval for um, kind of the setting the, the legislative requirements f for the city to move forward with, with both red light cameras and speed enforcement cameras. Great. Has there been any sort of conversation within staff in uh, what segments and or uh, arterials would be identified? Uh, we have an initial uh, list, but we're still finalizing that with uh, okay. PD. So, um, but there will be advanced signage and notice of those areas that are going to be enforced. Perfect. And and public safety obviously is involved in the conversation, of course, because they're the ones who would have to. Public safety's taking the lead on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they've 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 uh, they've been collecting data as well. They've got a couple of of uh, um, the uh, flashing radar units. So they've been building a database, sharing with us. We share our data with them, and they've been, been building that for some of their higher higher speed areas, just to look as to where we may want to start on on, on instituting um, the the use of the speed cameras. We're also looking at they're all, they are also looking at well we we're all one big team, um, looking at portable radar units to do that as well that can be moved around the city. Some will be fixed, some will be able to move, and then there's also red light cameras as well. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. If approved by council, when would the first speed cameras or red light cameras go in place? More than likely, it'll probably be in, in early next year. Um, we're looking at is is, it, is there an opportunity to, to fund some of those this year with, with certain dollars, um, but it is in the budget for next year. Um, so more than likely, I think the red light cameras would be next year. Might get some trailers this year still. So um, we're we're working at that. The biggest thing was getting past the the legislative components and getting the ordinance approved. Is that uh, is <clears throat> excuse me? Is that some sort of a project or CIP that would be S Safe Streets for All funded? You know, federal dollars that are available for that. Not for speed enforcement. At least we're not pursuing it at this time. We'd have to look to see uh, for the future whether there's there's a um, whether there's funding available. The the challenge with seeking some of those grants. An example you'll see is we we said, hey, we got awarded a grant for one point two million dollars. Those grants take can take up to a year to develop a grant agreement. So if we waited for some of that funding. If it is, is available, we'd be in the probably by next year sometime looking at at purchasing. Um, but there is some other other funding mechanisms that I think public safety is looking at to fund some other items. So not necessarily safe streets for all, but there's other other funding mechanisms that can su support and leverage um, leverage the the city dollars. No, I'm, I'm aware of that. I just figured if there was a way to obviously extend the funding out that would give us even more, let's say, bang for our buck if this was a program that we could, you know, really leverage. That's, that's why I was asking that. 
real quick. I'll just add, since they are a proven safety countermeasure, they are fully fundable with federal dollars and other dollars. So between the feds, the states, and local dollars, we'll be able to leverage any or all of the above to support our pending. Yeah, no, probably I'm accepted tomorrow night that program. So looking at starting, obviously with the dollars we absolutely. have now, but yes, fully, fully fundable. Yep. So originally we'd ask for your recommendations. We'll wait till December for that. We'll send this out to the all the members and just make sure they have a chance to review it. And any comments, we'll put this on for December meeting. Thanks. Okay, we'll move to uh, any information items on uh, number seven. No? Okay. Um, comments from board members? Well, sure. Uh, you know, a bit less than an hour in. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think the crash report's gotten better and easier to comprehend over the last three years now for me. Or three sessions, I don't know. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I commend the report, uh, you know, as I talked about, just add, add those titles at the, the top of the table so I remember what column I'm reading. <laughs> uh, but then I do have a kind of an interesting question because I, you know, with some repaving projects happening around town and then restriping, uh, an, an example on a road that I bike on all the time or drive on, uh, west of Kaufman, 4th was just done um, and repaved, striped just one block section. Uh, I just wonder what's the, what, what is the process of figuring out how much space we give two different modes. So I went out there and measured it. It was 13 foot, foot lane. Uh, the bikes did get a buffered lane, but you know, what, what, what could we have done with three more feet type, type of thing? And, and could it, could we have also, you know, I know the lane gets really tight once you get to the elementary school over there, uh, if you continue West. So I, I'm just wondering, could we have some consistency or are we just trying to update for present standards when we should be, you know, it's a, I would say it's not a commercial road with heavy trucks that need wide turns. So, so I wonder what 13 feet means. Yeah. So specifically the area in fourth Avenue is one we're looking at um, when we're doing like chip ceiling or um, kind of that re um, surfacing, uh, try to update the striping. Uh, and, and the goal is to make it consistent through, um, the area you're talking about, I think it's over by Main Street to, I think, Kaufman, I believe. Um, <clears throat> uh, Kaufman to uh, Terry was just recently done. Kaufman I know I know the, the Main Street section was also kind of done, but then mm -hmm. it'll get a little bit torn up with Kaufman Street. Project. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that area um, has a little bit of irregular wisp when it comes to the, um, the existing parking stalls for the businesses as well as the concrete islands that kind of pop out. Um, mm -hmm. So that area... It would either be an option of installing subpar bike lanes or installing the Sharrows, which I believe are right there currently. Um, but the goal is if we yeah. could fit, um, you know, bike lanes or any delineated facilities, um, try to fit those in where we, where we can, but um, avoid doing, you know, one block of uh, segmented and all of a sudden you get dumped off into uh, shared use lanes and back to normal and then back to that. So we're trying to create a a consistent experience through so drivers aren't surprised if a bicyclist it has to merge with them or not yeah well I, I'm, I'm just curious of you know the the three feet that kind of bugs me as like we, mm -hmm. we could have done a 10-foot lane and then had three feet of extra space for something else uh we, we have the you know it is shared what, a shero on the south side if you're if you're going east um along that section but you know i'm just talking about one one little block that's kind of annoying me so and uh but yeah uh so the south uh, the, the south side of fourth if you're going east is a sharrow the north side has a bike lane uh but the north travel lane um is a 13 foot wide lane and and again i just mm -hmm. say what could we have done with three extra feet 
Yeah, I, I will definitely revisit yeah, yeah. it. Um, but one thing I do, we do try to consider when we're designing these bike lanes and if they have delaying facilities is the physical width of the biker instead of saying a three foot lane um, for bikes when the bicyclist itself takes up right. at least two and a half, right. three feet and you're supposed to give another three feet for a passing. Uh, I realize mm -hmm. a lot of people don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're trying to get these bike lanes, we're trying to get bicyclists that built in buffer space instead of mm -hmm. just trying to crunch them in as much as we can yeah. just to say we put a, yeah. a bike lane in and and i know it's just paint but you know we we have proven research to show that narrow lanes slow down traffic so mm -hmm. so again that that three extra feet you yep. know I'm, I'm i'm a little bugged so that, that, that's all i got well I'll, I'll try to debug you a little bit um so one of the challenges i think we face is is when we take on some of the, the these these smaller scale paving jobs where we do like a block at a time it, it can tend to be kind of difficult to provide consistent facilities along the whole corridor um, now on fourth avenue that was a project we had looked at last year uh, there is a striping plan and we kyle and i would have to look at that and try to understand why we did put in 13 foot lanes because that's something we would have probably said yeah not something we normally would do. If we have an opportunity to, to reduce some of the lanes, we wouldn't have made them 10, I'll tell you that. Um, it, it's not a corridor that, that is, is conducive to a lot of speeding block to block. As you move further west, yes, we, we get some of those reports. But we'll take a look at it. We, do ha we did have a striping plan created because there was a, a discussion about whether we uh, you know, provide better, better bike facilities by eliminating parking. Uh, we have those discussions. Um, we are currently this year starting, at least right about now, starting to look at next year's paving program to see what, um, you know, what what is going to be our priorities. What are we going to have to to restripe? Um, the example I use is like last year on Fordham. That's when we decided, hey, let's make it, you know, eliminate the center turn lane, provide additional facilities for bikes. Uh, two lanes each direction or the road diet for one long block we did we we looked at fourth we did, i just have to look back at the plans to see what uh what we had had decided on and you know while we do our best in our field staff to make sure they comply with the plans there are times when contractors screw up and may have put 13 foot lanes in not 12 foot uh, more than likely we would have called for 11 or 12 um or, or they would have gone back to match the the previous, which may have been where they why they were thirteen. So right. we'll take a look at it and see yeah, if we yeah. can get you some more information. All right, I'll, I'll just uh, I'm a little concerned of not doing ten because you know research from NATCO and and other organizations, and then as well as around the country, is starting to advocate for that ten, potentially even a little less. Uh, so so I, I'm just wondering how. Ahead of the game, are we going to be? And then also, if we really want to change that paradigm, uh, we got to slow down the so, two-ton two machine. While we're yeah. looking through Vision Zero, we are all talking about additional standards, but NACO is not one we've adopted. Right. So our staff in, in streets is not looking at that, which is why we have a committee that, that basically they bring a bunch of people together to look at what we can and can't do mm -hmm. and, and what we can do. But we'll, we'll bear that in mind as we move forward, and, and we'll look back to see what, uh, what we may have been what we can do better. All right. Thank you. Who dictates the, the width of the road? Is it us? Is it the fire department? How, how do we get to that, you know, 10 foot or less width? Where does that, where does that come from? Basically the city has a development standards, which, uh, we also, we, we utilize for new, new projects. Um, but we also draw from um, the Ashto Green Book uh, for for streets. We look at CDOT standards, so we, we can draw from a number of, of, of places. Um, for roads, we, we want to look at some of your higher traveled roads with higher speeds. Are going to have wider roads or highways. Um, but most of our city streets are our local city streets are usually ten foot lanes. Um, collectors maybe a little bit wider. Uh, it depends on the use. What we're seeing, if we're seeing more trucks on the road, uh, and maybe a commercial area, um, we may extend it to 12 feet wide. Um, but we usually, you know, as part of our plan now, we're always always looking for collectors arterials. How do we fit in in better bike facilities? And sorry for the naive question, but what is the width of a tractor trailer truck? Like, um, probably about. 
uh, nine and a half to depends what they're equipped with. Um, so anywhere from like nine and a half, ten feet. Gotcha. Okay. They get mirrors and then also um, accounting for uh, possible sway. Got it. Um, and then going back to that Pratt Parkway and and uh, 119, um, has there been a lot of complaints about that? Because I drive that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, five o'clock in the morning, and those those signs are blinding, and uh, they've they've annoyed me, and the striping also annoys me, and sometimes I'm in the the lane and I have to kind of merge in to turn right onto 119. So I'm hearing other board members complain about it. Have we seen a lot of complaints about that intersection and um, what, what um, are we, gonna do about we have received comments about the intersection from various residents and business owners and uh, PD as well. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then for kind of changing gears a little bit, um, sidewalks on on Long's Peak um, and the ramps on that. Have you all had a lot of complaints complaints about that as well? Because uh, there's new ramps on Long's Peak on the west side, kind of towards. Uh, the golf course, there's new ramps uh, that were put in and there's some tripping hazards and uh, some some residents have complained to city council about those and haven't been addressed. So I don't know if you all have heard those complaints about the new uh, ramps. We, we've received, um, some of the residents have vocalized their, their concerns on those. Um, we have responded and addressed them, whether we, I don't know that we physically changed anything out there. Um, but the ramps were installed. They are in accordance with standards, and they are installed um, in accordance with um, American with Disabilities Act. Uh, changing ramps from um, what were were traditionally um, kind of the, the ramps in the middle of the the kind of the the radius to directional ramps. Um, basically, when you have uh, the ramps and and we have a lot of them in town that are are on the radius, they tend to push people into the lane of traffic is the, the primary reason why we've made changes. Um, I would have to, I know that, that the staff who worked on, on that um, decided to, to depart and head over to the water utility group, so I'd have to revisit to see what, what, uh, what we came up with. I think we were gonna have our, uh, the ADA, we've, we've got an ADA on call now, take a look at them and see if there's any issues. I'd have to revisit with our streets group on that. Yeah, because if you walk them, they're not very consistent. There's a fire hydrant in the way, and then some of them are set back pretty far. It's just not consistent. And, and, and part of the challenge is the is the road road isn't consistent either. It's on a hill. Sure. Um, it the, those that was a pretty challenging um, project when we we took it on uh, this year for resurfacing. So um, again, you know, uh, staff meets on those. We we talk about them. Um, I, again, I'd have to look back to see uh, where it where it landed. Okay. Great. Thanks. And that's all I had. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple comments and maybe some feedback, but um, it's great to see that we had a decrease in FSIs. I applaud that, the whole efforts by public safety, traffic, the whole group. I think that's great. Of course, you know, still the number with VRUs, 71. Um, I wish that were lower, of course. Um, and Jim, you had mentioned, you know, October – <clears throat> and, you know, why we're we seeing the highest number in October and what's the reason behind that, and I get all that. Um, have we thought about doing a PSA on October on the website, you know, um, something that would push out this information to residents rather than having it on a dashboard, I think actually trying to reach them as, as much as we can to say, hey, October's coming up and it's the highest crash month, you know, in, in the city of Longmont, so be aware there's kids out on the street or whatever. I think as we start utilizing the data and seeing it, I think we'll, we'll as, as Vision Zero starts to unfold, those programs will start to to come to light. Uh, I think it's an excellent suggestion. I think there's you know some other areas you know we can look at as well to get to get education, uh, get that out to the public. Yeah, and and you know uh, it sounds like you're uh, interfacing with public safety, the PD, which I think is great as well. Um, day of the week information, they're doing stops on you know. Uh, Friday, they let somebody know, hey, this is the highest crash day, you know, so slow it down. You know, that sort of stuff. I, I You know, I, any little thing we can do to reduce even one crash, I think, is helpful. And, and then I guess the last thing in regards to data is when I look at the um, comparison with other cities, 
and I know I've asked this before, I think I don't want to date myself the last two times we've looked at a crash report the last three times are we interfacing with uh, cities like Arvada Boulder Fort Collins Centennial Castle Rock and Greeley and I just noticed that they're all cities about our size that have a much lower uh, Greeley not as much uh, and, and I know that there's certain personalities to the city so Arvada and Boulder we could argue that they have narrower streets which they honestly do and and possibly that has the ability to lower speeds and I noticed that some of the cities that have the higher crash rates have the wider streets. I hate to say that, but it, I think it's true with a town like Colorado Springs. So I'm just curious if there's any sort of uh, discussions with these other cities to say, hey, is there anything, you know, secret sauce special that you're doing? To, you know, what are you doing with PD to, to collaborate? Um, because obviously Boulder, uh, Castle Rock, and Arvada are doing something right because they're literally less than half the number, 3.1. So I, I, you know, and, and since Boulder's a neighbor, I think, you know, I'm sure you guys have conversations with them and you may want to say something. Yeah, we actually do meet with uh, several cities and um, CDOT has some regional uh, kind of engineers get togethers uh, once or twice a year. Uh, we talk about projects we're doing, completed and just general questions for communities. So we get what, uh, with a lot of neighboring cities, uh, Loveland, Fort Collins, Superior, Lafayette, Louisville, um, as well as part of uh, Dr. Cog. We talked to a lot of different um, cities through there and they give updates on projects they're doing. Uh, one city that we talk to, or at least I talk to very often is uh, Littleton. They're doing a lot of the same technology and dealing with some of the same socioeconomic issues when it comes to transportation and highway deaths. Um, so we're kind of collaborating ideas and seeing what updates we have from a you know, year to year basis. Yeah, Aaron's a good guy. Um, I, I was just curious in regards to, you know, crash data, crash reports, because I know that every municipality generally does it. Um, is could there be a conversation with CDOT to say, why don't you do some sort of a crash data report kind of meeting seminar where we do have this collaboration and talk about these things? Because I, I don't think that's something that's on a regular kind of rhythm. Uh, with CDOT, and I think it ought to be, especially with Vision Zero being adopted by so many municipalities, um, it would make a lot of sense. At least that's just my thinking. And I, I get it's hard sometimes, but mm. I, I think it would be valuable information to share. Um, if you look up, um, they just released a new crash dash dashboard through Dr. Cog. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a combination of CDOT data as well as um, a lot of different cities. Um, I think we're the first north uh, Dr. Cog city, but they actually did bring a bunch of... Uh, crash data and options um, in a brand new dashboard that's accessible from either private or public. Um, so I'd recommend uh, checking that out through the Dr. Cog website. Yeah, I think I've seen that, but um, I we, appreciate we all the meetings too, uh, about, I think those are either monthly or um, bi-monthly uh, meetings for uh, just crash uh, data um, brainstorming. Great. Um, yeah, now I appreciate all this information. I know it's a, a big lift for the entire staff to do this, so I, I do appreciate all that. Um, so I guess with that, you have something else you want to add? Of course. Sorry, I just wanted to add a, a fun little note. Just Googled, you know, av the width of a Ford F-150 with tow mirrors is 8.8 .8 feet. Uh, with normal standard mirrors is 7.9. So thank you. Okay, um, let's move on to the items for the upcoming agenda. As noted, uh, we will not be having a meeting uh, in November because it falls on Veterans Day, which is a city holiday, as it should. So we will be meeting December 8th, um, and it looks like we've got 21st and Main update, Vision Zero update, as well as the 2025 work plan. Phil, is there anything else you want to add? We'll add the crash report just to kind of finalize that. And then you'll have your minutes from last month and this month. Thanks. Okay. Do I need to do a motion since we don't have a quorum or we just kind of, yeah. All right. We're adjourned. <laughs>